now. Okay. Well, welcome to everybody in the room and welcome to the online audience. Uh, we're really excited to start off our fall series for CORE with our speed geeking session. Uh, before we get started on that, I'm going to go through just a couple of the upcoming events so that you can have calendars and be prepared. One of them is tonight, and it leads me to want to talk a little bit about our new mediators group. Those of you who've been, we've scheduled three events for the fall. The first one tonight, we're going to have Jennifer Crawford uh, do a presentation on the business of mediation, and so give us some really practical tips on how to set up a business. We've also got two other events. We've got October 19th is a speed dating session, a chance for mediators, new mediators, to connect with mentors or potential mentors. I want to be really clear, there is no obligation, it is no more required that you actually make a connection than it is at any speed dating session. Now we've got some folks coming in, so I'll just let them come and get settled. Uh, but you, there is an opportunity, there's a potential to make a match with a mentor at that session. Um, we've also got November 8th, um, a panel on finding work. All of those are going to take place here. They're going to take place in the evenings. And I just want to make sure everybody knows subscribed to the ongoing speaker series. You're not automatically part of the new mediators group. You need to join that separately, already subscribing full time. The 20 fee is going to $50 membership new mediators group and you can get the $25 for the subscription so it can go either way you can do both but please talk to me I need costs that come to bear when we have the new mediators group well unless you can actually participate we have two more events this term we've got October 30th we've got collab grants which is our your team building skills and then we have our November 14th is going to be our annual ethics session, which as usual is a two hour session and allows everybody who is trying to meet specific ethics CPD qualifications to meet all of them in that one session. All right, from there, I'm going to tell you, we're going to start the speed geeking. And this is going to be fun, but it's going to be fast. So I am going to be timing. We're going to invite people up in the order that is appearing on this particular chart here. We'll flip it over. Each of our speakers has five minutes to present on a topic that excites them in the area of dispute resolution, conflict resolution, or something that is sufficiently related that they feel that they can pose it as being about one of those topics. <laughs> and I, I, yeah, I say that having seen some of the titles. <laughs> we have some very creative speakers here tonight but we'll let them make the connection for you. They have five minutes to share whatever that exciting idea is. And at four minutes, if you're a speaker and you don't know this, I will be holding up my hand in the front row. If at five minutes you haven't ceased to speak, you will be hearing Jonathan Colton playing Re Your Brains because it's a really good negotiation song. And that is the cutoff, the absolute cutoff. You then have three minutes to answer questions to the audience. Um, and then we'll do a transition and we will have the next person come up. Speakers, pause and tie up Mark Meredith to start us off. I simply say Mark is apparently going to be speaking about taxing authorities. I'm not frozen, I'm just waiting for the, uh, for the video to be running. Well, that's also problematic. We seem to be frozen here, but... Okay. Is, is singularly a part, uh, in as much as I'm. Um, Sharon asked me if, if I could speak a little bit about a different perspective on the use of mediation skills. And as a tax lawyer, it may seem a little bit strange, but at least it's my my perspective that a lot of what I do in a lot of the different facets of my practice involve dispute resolution skills. My practice ranges. I do, I do dispute work with, with the Canada Revenue Agency on the other side where I'm representing a client in dealing with those issues. Um, I deal with, uh, with clients in, in business transactions and representing them in business transactions. I represent them when they're planning collectively with, let's say, their family for business succession or, or estate planning stuff where, uh, where sometimes interests can vary. Um, the way I think of using my, my uh, dispute resolution skills in that context, 
a lot of the time while I'm representing the client, I actually have to step back and be a bit of the person in the middle to, to facilitate, let's say, my client vis-a-vis -vis CRA um, in appreciating what the, what the other side cares about. Because believe it or not, with CRA, for example, it's not always the case that they care about the money. The institution cares about the money, but the individual cares about a lot of other things, like their workload, like feeling like they're doing the good thing to pr protect the, the fisc. So there's a lot of, of different interests, and sometimes it's important for me to be able to step back uh, from representing my client to help each side understand the other's interests. And so I, I kind of think of what I'm doing in some context, at least, as, uh, as serving sort of a, a mediation function. I realize I'm somewhat abusing the terminology, um, and Sharon will agree with me there, no doubt. Um, but to, to help understand their real interests and, uh, and needs. Um, so that's what I do. Um, I suppose it's a place where, uh, where professional mediators could find, a, uh, could find a place. There's been talk of there being a true process of mediation or, or, uh, or other non-administrative uh, non dispute resolution in tax contexts. The reality falls far short of, of, uh, of what has been described, but we can still use our skills, and I think it's incredibly important for tax lawyers who are doing any of those different areas of practice to appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the, the skills that they could glean from, indeed, from mediation training. Um, I was told to go fast, so <laughs> I've gone fast. Um, apparently, I have three or four minutes if anybody has any questions. Otherwise, I'll yield the floor to people who are slightly less geeky or maybe a lot less geeky. I don't think that's happening. Quit and, and Darcy is passing me a quick note that questions to the front so that we can get it recorded. Do we have any questions? I actually have a question. Can I get you to come up, um, Colleen? Or Just I'll repeat it all right. if it's short. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Go for it. Anonymous, no. um, what's fascinating for me is the power imbalance that you must often, in terms of negotiating with um, Revenue Canada, uh, any thoughts about how you manage that? Sure. The, the, the question being, how do you manage power imbalances in negotiating with CRA? Um, sometimes it's very difficult uh, because, at least in form, CRA has all of the power, absolutely. Um, but part of the way you balance that out as, as, a, as a representative of the taxpayer is recognizing that there are a bunch of other interests other than just we're going to, on the part of CRA, other than just we're going to win and extract the maximum amount of, of money we care about. Some of the counterbalances are, at different levels, people, individuals, actually care about coming to the right answer, not just the answer that generates the most money for the, for the FISC. Um, at the lower levels, you sometimes have to balance that with, uh, with relative lack of experience, so the, the, the CRA person is more powerful in form, but they're weaker actually in terms of their technical knowledge. So, there, so it's, it's, yes, there are power imbalances, absolutely, and you have to compensate for them, but they're not necessarily just the obvious ones. For those of us that aren't tax lawyers, what's the FISC? Oh, pardon me. Uh, for, the, for those who aren't tax lawyers, the FISC is, is short form for the, uh, the giant pocket of cash that the, uh, the government has which is, in fact, of course, just the sum and substance of all of our pockets. That is the FISC, short for fiscal resources. Very good. <laughs> all right. Switch. All right, thank you. Which means, uh, for the folks on the live stream, Darcy's going to set up, but we're going to call up CD Saint. Um, and we'll let you come up so Darcy can frame you. And when she tells you that you're framed, that is when you can start. <laughs> okay. Give it a go. <laughs> it feels really odd to be on this side of the room. <laughs> it's not usually my place. Okay, cool. So I'm here to talk about why 
we as mediators should sing in the shower. And part of that is about what do we do in the morning? How do we actually prepare ourselves for the day? If you're like me, I shower every morning. Not everybody does, and that's fine, you know, whatever. Or maybe you shower at night. That is okay too. Um, it still holds true that you should sing in the shower. Uh, I just think it works a little bit better in the morning. When we are getting ready for mediation or for mediating, it's important to actually still warm up. And we don't often think about how we're actually warming ourselves up. And part of what we need to do is be able to link what's happening in both hemispheres of our brains. This is not where you thought this was going, was it? Into like what's actually happening in our brains. So, you know, when we talk about the right side of the brain being about synthesizing parts to a whole, gee, that sounds like something mediators do when you take somebody's story and you actually, the dis different parts of the stories and what other people are telling you, and you're putting that together to create a complete narrative. So, and then you also have the subjective aspects. So the layers of cultural meaning of the language that we're using, but it's the cultural meaning of the language that's being used, not the actual language itself. Um, and then we also have uh, patterns and relationship recognition. So it's understanding what the relationships are between everybody. These are all really common aspects of right brain sort of thinking. And then we have our left brain, you know, where we're linear, we're thinking and this is what we're going to do. This is the part that most of us do in the morning really well. You get up, you shower, you get dressed, you eat, you probably brush your teeth somewhere in there, but it's gonna be in the same spot every day. I always sh brush my teeth after I've gotten dressed and eaten, no idea why it's in that particular order, but it needs to be in that order. So this is the kind of thing that we're already doing with our left side of the brain, and it's all structure related. And these are the types of things where our motor skills are also involved, because we don't need to actually think about them. These are the rote things that often come through our day. So this is one of the reasons why I'm suggesting we should sing in the shower as a way of warming ourselves up to do our daily work. Music requires both sides of the brain to be engaged simultaneously. And I'll give you an example of what that looks like. I'm gonna clap out a rhythm. If you can identify the song that this is from, raise your hand. And then after that, I will just, I'll give you the, the notes, the tune of the rhythm, which is what the right side of the brain is, right? The rhythm is our left side, this is structure oriented. The right side is, is content and meaning and relationships. So here is the rhythm. No, but close. Mary Had a Little Lamb? Yes. Oh. <laughs> and so, but can you recognize Mary Had a Little Lamb from do 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 That is also Mary Had a Little Lamb, just without the rhythmic structure. So when we have it together, we're actually putting them together. Now, if you want to do this really well and actually get yourself fully engaged, this is when you actually get up or, yeah, stand up with me. <laughs> I haven't got a hand yet, so we can do this for one second. Oh. <laughs> if you stand, and if you just sort of start marching in place, so uh, left, 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 right, left, and then sing with me, left, uh, three, four. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. And what we've done by incorporating more motors, motor skills and a regular beat to the rhythm and the tune that we've been doing and the language we've added onto that, we're incorporating all of these things together which include our supplemental motor areas of the brain and our basal ganglia. Why do we care or what's important about this? Vocal quality doesn't matter. A 2005 study found that it actually doesn't matter in um, release of endorphins happens with singing. We also get a decrease in cortisol, so we're less stressed, we're less anxious. It releases oxytocin, which also increases our trust and bonding capacities, especially if we do it with people. And it increases our alertness. So this is how I suggest you warm up for your day. <laughs>
Yeah, you must stay up there. You've got three minutes oh, for questions. questions. Right, sorry. Oh, yeah. that's a good... If anybody has questions. I have a question. <laughs> What's your favorite song to sing in the morning? Um, it changes every morning. I didn't get the music. I didn't get played off. That wasn't you. That wasn't you. That was me. And we'll just assume I'm Nicole Kidman. I'm, I'm immune <laughs> to being played off. Um, I can talk as long as I want. Uh, there is no one specific song. It depends on mood. As it should. Go with where you are. Well, I teach mediation, so I'd really like to um, have... Do, is there a link to a website or something that... Uh, so that I could justify doing this exercise with my class? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, it, I, I pulled stuff from a number of, of studies and reports and articles. Okay. Um, but I can certainly cobble that together into something useful in that sense. That's maybe a good personal development thing as well. <laughs> um, but so I don't know if you teach at JI or? Uh, at Langara. Okay. Um, so I was just wondering, because uh, Roshan Dinesh, he, uh, posits that um, peace is a complex component. It's dynamic and it's complex. And so when we look at um, unity as a statement of peace, and when we're out of unity, when things are out of balance, that's when we fall out of a peaceful state into conflict. Okay. So we look at that. One of the concepts he likes to use is that there's diversity in unity. And one of the easiest ways to explain that, I think, is with music. Because you have rhythm, you have tone, you have like notes, you have pitch, you have language included, and you can also fit other songs together to create something different. And that's what we're all trying to do, mm -hmm. is take these different realities and actually work them into a place where they can all work together. And so if you use things like even the, um, one bottle pop, two bottle pop, three bottle pop, four bottle pop, fish and chips, vinegar, vinegar, go through your drink in my backyard. All of those three songs all fit together simultaneously. And so you can add more and more layers onto how you're actually fitting everything together to do the same. Mm. But yeah, I'd be, you know, I can throw something together. Okay, great, thank <laughs> sure. you. Thanks, yeah, problem. I might also note that this will be this video we will give to you. You can also post that with your wonderful. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 I'm feeling like I need to talk really fast. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> I will invite you up, Janine. And again, okay. uh, once Darcy gives you the signal. Okay. She will have you framed and you're ready to go. Okay. So I've been doing work in Papua New Guinea for about uh, the last 10 years, particularly in Bougainville. And Bougainville is a Melanesian um, area. So I've since I was there in April and I observed people who are on the different side of a civil war that had gone on for 15 years and ended in a peace agreement in 1999 and they were completely at ease with themselves, with each other. And um, I'd also um, had the experience of calling, uh, trying to reach people a number of times and not being able to get them and being told, oh, there's been a killing up north and he's gone up to do a reconciliation and we'd gone for a few days. So uh, I became really interested in reconciliation and how it developed um, in Melanesia. So it turns out that for thousands of years, Melanesians have used consensus decision-making, uh, reconciliation, mediation, and what we would call restorative justice. Uh, but the colonial administrative powers decided that that should not uh, that should be stopped, that chiefs should not be allowed to administer this. Uh, and so for about 100 years, um, that w it wasn't carried out. And then in about 1973, just before PNG was about to become um, independent, uh, it was reintroduced into the law of PNG. So, um, it wasn't that they were such virtuous people. It was really a matter of survival and getting on with everybody that, that they had these practices. 
and they recognised that conflicts could be inherited and passed down from one generation to another. And that, this is something that is in my reading has come up time and time again. That's what they want to avoid, this passing down of conflict. Okay, so uh, there's a ritual, um, uh, ritual traditional uh, reconciliation ceremony. They have a neutral person. Uh, they, they have a cooling down payment that occurs before negotiations can begin. Now, this would be typical uh, where there's been a death. Uh, so the cooling down payment goes for the other party, passed through a neutral person, that's a token of trust. Uh, and it um, is a demonstration of admitting guilt and that they're prepared to pay compensation. In most cases, they meet in a neutral location. Women don't participate at that stage because it's feared that their grief will arouse men's emotions and lead to fighting on the spot. It's a matrilineal society. Land is passed down through the females. Women are protected from involvement in major disputes because that's a very important aspect of uh, their life. Um, there's a whole ritual that involves a feast. Uh, many people come to it. The idea is there's lots of witnesses to the reconciliation. Uh, they chew betel nut, um, <clears throat> which uh, with mustard and lime, uh, which is um, very common over there. And uh, then the betel nut is spat into a particular dish, put into a hole, covered with a stone. All of this has a lot of um, importance to it in the ceremony. And then they eat together like brothers and sisters. So in um, between 1972 and 1989, a mine was established in Bougainville. The mining company took over, bull down, bulldozed down people's homes, established a township. Um, and then there was a huge um, crisis. Uh, um, there was 20,000 people killed out of a population of about 200,000. So eventually there was a peace agreement in 1999, but in order to accomplish that, they decided, it was decided to go back and look at reconciliation. And it was a series of reconciliations that took place over that period of time. 1997 was their year of reconciliation. They're still going on today. I've met people who've gone and uh, gone through this process. And uh, it's a continual process as they mend and move forward. And five minutes doesn't do it justice. But no, it doesn't. doesn't. Like it. <laughs> yes. So, so I think that's the end of my time. It yeah. is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, you have five seconds. But <laughs> All right. Questions, though? Yes. So when disputes arise between women, how does that get solved? Uh, I don't know. Oh. Uh, I'm not, I've just sort of started looking yeah. at this. I, I imagine the same sort of thing, mm -hmm. that they have an independent person. Um, but I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Does an independent person have a title? Is it like a conflict person? Or uh, like no, not usually, although I know that in connection with, uh, I have a client who owns a lot of cattle, yeah. and the cattle graze along the streets, and then they eat various people's gardens, mm -hmm. and so there is somebody who um, actually comes in and mediates that, uh, and I think it's actually an official government person with a title, but I can't recall the title. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how did you end up there? I don't, don't understand. Oh, um, well, I first went there when I was a teenager, actually, to visit. And so I've just had an interest in the area. And then I have um, some clients I'm, uh, over there. So I've, I've done work through those clients. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Well, I will ask you one question, Janine. Yes. Um, would you like to come back and do a fuller presentation on the topic? Because yeah. it would be so, great to have a chat. Oh, thank you. I'll, I'll think about that. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank thank you. You. Jan, same scoop. Darcy will tell you when she is ready for you.
when I am out of frame, presumably. I hope I can get this done in five minutes. <laughs> It'll be interesting. <laughs> I'm talking about integrity today, and it was inspired by an article that I read on Facebook, and it made me think about how that relates to what we do as mediators. Um, integrity is a very powerful word in our society. Uh, it describes a state of being that most of us ascribe to, but it also um, describes a wholeness or completeness of a thing or a process. So in my mind, when we talk about integrity and mediation, it both means what we bring to the table as mediators, as people with integrity, but also ensuring that our processes demonstrate integrity. And um, my goal is to talk about both of those. So when we think about personal integrity, we relate that to um, words like honesty, morality, and ethical behaviors. Um, and in fact, the standard definition is the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles and a moral uprightness. Um, and it's easy to um, think about that that's what we want, but then how do we demonstrate <laughs> that as we get into our mediation process? Uh, so some of the things that um, I have thought about is, first of all, the top of the list of um, what it means to be a person with integrity is to be a person who is honest. And demonstrating honesty is more than just being truthful. It includes having a sincere nature, being genuine, frank, and forthright in your communication. Uh, it would include things like um, not pretending to have knowledge about subject matters that you don't know, uh, which can come up frequently in reality checking, um, having an awareness of your own biases, uh, ensuring that your words and actions are consistent, and also being authentic as you present yourself to the people that you're working with. Um, I think that it's really important as an integral person, or a person with integrity, to create and adhere to your own set of uh, moral and ethical values. And uh, that means um, having the ability to, and the self-analysis to know what those are, to identify what's important to me um, and what am I bringing into the room with me as a mediator. Um, there's a lot of values that we ascribe to mediation um, that we may see differently than the people we're working with when it comes to things like autonomy, self-determination, impartiality, independence, um, neutrality, not being judgmental, um, how we handle conflicts of interest and respect, and how those get conveyed to the people that we work with. Uh, I think it's important um, to be intentional in how we apply our values and our beliefs and our principles in our role as mediator. Um, having an awareness that the way that we think about values and beliefs and principles is reflected in our actions. And similarly, our actions and our words give an indication of who we are as people and what our underlying values are. Um, the natural extension of that is you want to be sure that when you're mediating, that the words and behaviors that you have as a mediator reflect what's important to you about the process. And that you need to be aware and also be wary of how your words and behaviors can impact the people that you're working with. Um, I think it's important to be consistent and reliable. Uh, people come to mediators looking for someone to trust in times of great need, and um, consistency in your presentation helps develop that trust. You need to have a consistent character between your meetings with individuals and in the group, and also between different mediations that you do. You need to have transparency, um, and that means you need to be able to communicate effectively about what you're doing and why you're doing it and also be transparent about mistakes that are made or limitations you have in the process. Uh, you need to have a competency for the type of uh, work that you're doing um, and ensure you have the right skill set to help the parties you're working with. And you need to be humble. You need to remember that the mediation isn't about you, it's about the people that you're there to serve. Now, we also need to have integrity in our process and um, that means ensuring that our process has that wholeness and completeness to get the parties where they need to go. Um, that includes creating a framework that is appropriate for the dispute that, we live, that we're dealing with. And you can't take one framework and transfer it between different types of disputes. Uh, when you get into the dispute, you need to be able to sort of have a plan and carry it out, but also have the flexibility to manage changes as the clients need. You need to create ground rules that are going to work for the people and then ensure that those ground rules are enforced, particularly when it relates to things like good faith, full disclosure, listening actively, respect in language and behavior and confidentiality. You need to value the people you're working with and their time and the resources um, and ensuring that the mediation is running away to take that into account. You need to ensure your process is fair and that you complete what you begin. So um, make sure that you carry out your promises around neutrality. Uh, make sure that when you start the process, 
you understand you're in for the long haul, and if for some reason you can't be, that you have a safe exit route for yourself and the participants. And you want to ensure that you review your process from time to time um, and ensure that it continues to meet the needs of your clients. And I think that's my five minutes. Yes. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> Good work. Short version of that. Um, any cool. questions? Stop. Stop. Sorry. I know. It was I just so it thrilled by my presentation. It is. Why is okay, I have a question. I'll just yeah. speak over her music. Speak over the music. Okay. I've, well, I've turned on the sound so, now. So just, <laughs> you know, because personal integrity is kind of a work in progress, like most mediation mm -hmm. skills. Um, what is sort of the stuff that you see where it's like, where you're, you are like wondering if you're on the line, like personal practices you have for being like, oh, I could have done better here. And can I get you to repeat questions, Jen? Just okay, so, so the question that I'm being asked is, um, that um, personal integrity is, is something that we, we grow and develop. And that's, I think, one of the hallmarks of having integrity is your accountability is, is that when you get new information, um, that you actually question yourself and say, how does that apply and be willing to change your beliefs as you grow as an individual with, with people. Um, and I think that, um, I mean, I think for me sometimes where I find I struggle with um, probably the integrity is, is on the confidentiality piece. So I go into mediation and I tell people this is confidential if you want to share it outside that process. But sometimes as mediators, we need to be able to go back and reflect to other people about what happened so that we can develop our skill. And so that becomes that line of, I've committed to all these people, I'm going to keep it confidential. But on the other hand, in order to continue to be the best professional I can be, I need to be able to share that, um, whether it be to develop skills or sometimes just to dump, you know, that, you deal with some really sensitive subject matter, you just need to process. Is that kind of what you were asking? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyone else? You do have a minute and a yeah. half. <laughs> I can finish my presentation when I had <laughs> 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 a whole other topic yet. <laughs> yeah? Question. Do you change your style depending on who is in the room? Completely. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I actually was telling a story earlier. So the question is, do I change my style? Um, my style, I, when I think of, of mediating, I, I, like it, 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 it's all of it. it. It's the room, the atmosphere, how you present yourself. And uh, so I was telling a story earlier about having a mediation. Um, and my mom saw me in the morning and I was wearing torn jeans. And she's like, I can't believe you're going to work in torn jeans. I'm like, well, mom, I'm mediating with a 17-year-old, you know, which is very different then if I'm going into a personal injury mediation uh, where you've got sort of a lot of lawyers present and, and people coming in with a different expectation about that. Uh, and I think that's just sort of one of the ways your language changes. If you deal with low capacity people, there's lots of different things you, you're flexible with. I don't really have a question, but I just think it's really interesting. I don't think I've ever thought about separating out the two of the, the integrity of the mediator and the integrity of the process. So I don't really have a question. I just I, I think that's really interesting and thought provoking. So yeah. I just wanted to say that. Well, and I have to say that's something that developed as I was um, sort of thinking about how I wanted to present this. And you know, you start by looking at definitions, and 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 that's how the definitions are. Like there's integrity as a person, and there's integrity of a thing, and integrity of a process. And we and we use it in all those ways, but just sort of applying it to a different with a different lens. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, Jen. <laughs> it is your turn. I'm going to stand here and not thump the table much, okay? Yeah, go for that. <laughs> <laughs> Tend to talk with my hand. So my topic is why are we so resistant to trying new things as mediators? And this sort of, this topic kind of came to me as we were doing our sort of pig and potato design speaking and rounds and teaching with zombie fighters coming across people who were saying, this can be my context, or I'll let you know if I ever get brave enough to try it. And, and I heard that a lot. Or I'd check in with people later and they'll be like, oh, I haven't, I, I haven't been brave enough to try it, though it probably would have been really good with the these sets of families I've worked with or these other places. And I'm like, okay, so this is really interesting. And then I was talking with a small business client about solving a problem that they had and, and we're talking and I, and he's like, well, I just, I, I'm, I, I'll let you know if I ever get brave enough to have this conversation. I'm like, 
like, oh, that's interesting. And, and I'm like, well, why, what about something like mediation? Could you bring something? Oh, well, that wouldn't work in this context. I'm like, okay, so this is really interesting, right? I, had the, I have these two spaces, and in one space, we have mediators saying, oh, I'm afraid, and dismissing things out of hand. And it's the same things I hear from clients who are being resistant about engaging in conflict resolution. And so then going back and looking at a lot of the research and literature on this, what we find is that those things that are new and the things that we're afraid of or things that are really hard to do are exactly the kinds of shifts we're asking our clients to make to engage in these kinds of resolution processes. And yet, more and more often, I'm finding that when I talk to people, we're afraid to make ourselves do them. And so I, I found this piece really, really interesting. Why are we afraid to do this? And yet, we're asking them to work with us to do it over and over and over and over again. And to me, it, this is sort of one of the pieces where it's like, how can I engage in this work and ask people to do these things over and over again if I am not brave enough to do them myself? And so this is kind of a question that I wanted to pose to the people that are doing mediation work, if you can't try new things, because that's what you're asking your clients to do. And if you can't be brave enough to do these things that are awkward or uncomfortable, because that's what you're asking your clients to do, do you understand them enough to really work with them in a way that gets them to the places they need to go? And so when I was in that kind of space and thinking about that, then we're sort of having to take the advice that we keep giving to our clients. That space where, oh, you know, you have to embrace that feeling, being really <coughs> awkward and uncomfortable, right? You know, you have to, maybe you have to ask for help or partner with somebody or get somebody else in the room with you. Right? Maybe you need that little bit of extra training or that person that's gonna hold you accountable. So if you're doing you know, coaching, often you're gonna do that thing because on Friday you're talking with your coach who's gonna ask you how it went. Right? Do you have that accountability buddy where you're saying, I'm gonna try this in a mediation this week and then on Friday I'm gonna talk to you and you're gonna ask me how it went. I'm way more likely to try doing that. Right? Um, and then there's that other space of do you schedule it in? So this is one of the pieces of advice that I routinely give to my business clients is schedule your conflicts. And when I look at things that I'm really uncomfortable doing, really uncomfortable actually engaging in, I schedule their use. So maybe I'm not so comfortable in a setting pulling out a card game to play, but it would be the right setting for it. It's a family with teenage kids that are sort of younger teenagers. It's the perfect context for it. I will actually pencil it into my process plan, right? And that way we actually have it happen so I can't back out later because I'm nervous. And so I just, I would really like us to kind of think about as mediators, how when we find ourselves being resistant to things because the context isn't right, and yet I know people that are working in similar contexts who have tried things like that successfully. Or people who are really excited to have those spaces shaken up. Often lawyers have done the same thing over and over and over again. And if you bring in an interesting th new thing for them to try, it's exciting for them because it's not the same process that they've been doing over and over and over again. And so I really want us to think about how we continue to grow and change within our own practices. And I think I'm out of time. Pretty much. <laughs> Questions? Hard part. So I'm giving you time to think what was being said to come up with a question. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that um, that's part of that integrity piece that I was talking about. Like, do, like, do you think that like having being willing to explore creativity is part of your own integrity? And could you repeat a little bit? Um, so the question was, um, like, tying back to the integrity piece, is, ex is that pushing of creativity part of integrity? I think it is in that personal growth kind of space where, you know, as part of having integrity is being the best person you can be in the room, and how can you be the best person in the room if you're not attempting to incorporate new learning and new skills? <laughs> well, thank you, Meta. 
it is hard to respond with questions, isn't it? So I'm going to go frame for Darcy. Okay. <laughs> you might have to change anything on this. You're similar height to the I'm sure. 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 So is it just to start, Darcy? Uh, yeah, when you're. The frame looks great. If the frame's good, then it's a. Yeah, it's just to start. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Darcy. Uh, I am not a mediator. Uh, what I am is a writer uh, and a filmmaker, which is why I'm running a bunch of cameras right now, and I know there's some frame dropping happening on the live stream. I apologize. Um, so what I want to talk about is how stories and storytelling uh, ends up being really centered around conflict. And in fact, at film school, I heard day in and day out, I cannot tell you how many times, story is conflict. And what that basically translated to is nobody's really interested in hearing about your day that went exactly as you planned it and nothing strange happened and everything was fine. And people want to tell their stories similarly about how awful the traffic was and it was impossible to find parking and also a squirrel darted in front of me and I swerved and those are the interesting parts of the story. Not about I got dressed as I always do and I walked to my car and it was normal. Um, and so that, that sort of idea about stories being structurally all about that conflict uh, is something that I think we all are very familiar with. It, it happens in film school and in a film setting. It happens uh, even earlier on. We start learning about the structure of stories in our you know, grade four English classes. And we draw that beautiful line of here's the, here's the introduction, us learning all about our characters. And then a horrible thing happens and we start going up and rising, rising conflict until the peak, the climax. And then we come down, <laughs> and that's our, that's our resolution. That's the end of the conflict. And that is how we talk about stories uh, to young children. We say, this is how a story works. There's a huge conflict. That's the meaty middle part of your story every time. And we keep using that. Uh, we get a little bit more sophisticated as we continue in our storytelling practices. Uh, we start talking about it in terms of acts. Act, act one is our our introduction, it's a little bit shorter. In a, in a feature film setting, it's about a half hour and you meet all your characters, you set up what their normal is. And then act two comes and this is when the conflicts are starting and you start to say, oh, here, here's a conflict and then we raise the stakes and we make it worse and we raise the stakes again. And that's, then we have our final huge climax at the end of act two. And then we talk about act three, which is a much shorter part of the story. The, those last 10 minutes where we wrap up the love's triangle and we celebrate <laughs> the big win and Chewbacca doesn't get a medal. And that's, <laughs> and that's, that's how we start to talk about that, that story process. And, and that continues to be true um, in situations in real life. It, it's reflected in the way that we talk about our stories. And it's interesting to think about that when you're dealing with people who are in conflict, that that's the way that they're thinking about their conflict. So while you might be walking in in the middle of their climax, they have all this other information that they're thinking about. They have their entire introduction where they've been plotting, you know, I'm the good guy, I'm, I'm the hero of this story, and they have their horrible moment where everything went wrong, and they'll tell you about when everything went wrong and conflict started to happen. And they have their own ideas of what the stakes are. You know, the stakes are higher because of this and this and this, and that's why we're here at this climax point. So you're really only coming in for act three. And that's something that I think is important to remember when you're coming in to, to any kind of situation and where you're talking about conflict. Because people are going to tell, your, tell their stories from that perspective. Uh, and they're going to reinforce their own ideas as they retell this story about how hor horrible this other person is. And they're going to reinforce it every time they retell their story. Thank you. Um, uh, they're going to reinforce it for themselves and they're going to just continue to tell that story. So when you are listening to people's stories, uh, it's important to remember that, that they're centering it around the conflict. They're not thinking about the resolution. Um, yeah, and I think that's all I need to say. Okay. <laughs> How many frame drops do we have? <laughs> I, sorry. It's okay. I can't handle the frame drops. It's okay. It's okay. I'll try not to think about it. It's um, a thing. Question? 
wasn't a question, but uh, when you were speaking, I was thinking of the Disney movies, right? They, they all start off so lovely, get through that story, like you say, the intro, then yeah, something bad happens. So and that's just like real life, right? Absolutely. And the kids are exposed to that, that sort of story from a very young age, right? Absolutely. Very common. Can you repeat? Uh, yeah, that? yeah. So, so the comment is is that uh, kids are introduced to this kind of, of story structure. Um, and this big conflict situation from a very young age, even in Disney movies that all, all begin with mm. the peaceful moment and the good song and then, oh no, big crisis. Um, and, and I would say that that's absolutely true. It's, it's there in all the Disney movies, which are all very, very structured. Um, but it's true in, in most media, in, in the Harry Potter series, in all the, all, most books, all the short mm. stories we read in school so that we can learn about story structure. It's, it's there in all of the media that we are ingesting from a very young age. Um, so we start to really internalize that idea of th this is what's important in a story. Is co story is conflict. Yeah. 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 Um, in film school, when you're sort of learning the skills around this, yeah. uh, like are there sort of, like, sort of traditional ways that you transition from conflict to end that maybe might be applicable to what we do to help people move from that conflict into that third act? Well, admittedly, when you're when you're learning how to how to deal with conflict, a lot of the the idea is to write yourself into a corner. So you get a lot of advice that is just keep making it worse and worse and worse until nothing could possibly get worse. Um, so unfortunately, <laughs> that's not going to help you. <laughs> but when you're thinking about um, uh, about resolution as a writer, a lot of the time, uh, it's about finding that satisfactory conclusion that that ties up all the loose ends. So it ties up that, that I, well, it really comes down to the idea of it started at this kind of normal, and when the resolution comes down, you're not coming to the same normal, you're coming to a new normal. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, embracing that and finding ways to make all those different raise the stakes, climb, you know, mini, mini climaxes work, um, that's, you're focusing on making those things work out into a way that can settle into a new normal. That works for everyone. Yeah. Okay. Do cultural influences change the progression of a storyline? If you, do you see different types of storylines depending uh, on cultural? I don't have any time and to answer. You got thirty seconds. Thirty to seconds. Add to that. Uh, <laughs> cultural things, absolutely. Um, cultural ideas definitely change the way stories are structured. Although often uh, it still will translate into a very similar idea. You still mostly want to tell the story about that bad thing, that conflict. You're rarely going to tell the story about everything went normally and good. Yeah. Um, Am I good? Yeah. Sorry, we don't. You don't really have time to answer that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Thank you. All right. Let me try. You go hit yours. And happily, Jim knows he's next. But uh, I will flip this you over. Know, you so know, the turning people. We're both racing up there. <laughs> <laughs> We're do well. We're doing well. <laughs> you guys yeah. are actually staying really nicely on time. You scared the living daylights out of all of us. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually startled. This is one of the first times we've ever been on time with anything at all that we've ever done with Core. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm very impressed with everybody. Get up to where you are. Yeah. Ready? Yeah. Hello. It's it's really nice to be here, and it's really nice to talk about befriending judgment, which is something very dear to me. This topic came up from, uh, I, I was in Argentina last winter, and I went to hear a neurologist talk about how the brain functions, and how we take in all the information that makes our life, and essentially put it in memory. And I, whoa, that's interesting. So the point that he made was that we live in the past, that we don't live now, most of the time, the information that we use to make our decisions daily is something that happened before. We went to school, we went to film school, you know? All these things, they're in the past. They're not now. And the relationship between us and our knowings got me thinking, you know, huh. Judgments are also in the past. They're a form of knowing, of learning that we take on, and it doesn't live with us right here. And I thought, huh, well, 
I'd like to see myself bringing all these memories up and looking at them. It doesn't happen very often. No. Very often do I go back and go, well, I believe this, but now it's been 10 years or five years or whatever, it's no longer valid. I go, whoa. So this idea of befriending judgment was to, in a way, invite my relationship with judgment to be more present and to be more aware of how uh, this, this thing that we do all the time, this judging, how it works, you know, and how it works in me. One of the things that I started to look at was all the, the great religions and all the societies throughout history all commented on judgment. You, know, you, you can really pick out all kinds of examples. And this, this idea that I got from looking at all these judgments in terms of history was that there was a common thread, and most of them was, uh, you know, the comment was all the same, don't judge, you know, judge not, don't judge. And in a funny way, it was important in all these comments that we be with rather than be in judgment. So how, how we are with somebody, and how we listen to them, and how we are as mediators in your integrity. Funny, all the topics so far have related in a very beautiful way, no? Uh, <laughs> to create a, a, an image of being in service to people. You're not, you're not uh, judging, you're not even judging yourself, you're not even judging what you have to say. You're quite simply judging your service. And so it comes up, what is it that we do? And I think that we do service. And if it works, we bring peace to a situation. If it works, it's peace. And like you said, you double check, triple check. Am I, am I coherent? Like what you said too. Like what CD said, let's warm up to do this. You know, it, it's beautiful how it all works together. Anyway, at the end of all, all of this, I, uh, I think that that is the key to it, is it to focus on living in the now to as much as we can, not bring preconceptions to the situation, not bring our prejudices to the situation. That's a great word, prejudice. <laughs> so if you're with somebody and you're listening without filter, it's much likely to be all that is ever needed. Somebody really needs to hear, like what you said, no? and to be aware of the cycle of things. Anyway, I'd like to finish up with two little things. Okay, you got 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> One is, when I was thinking about all this, I thought, well, if I was to write a story, and judgment was the main character, so that's a little job for you if you want it. You can write a little story, or a little page or two, about your character judgment. And the other one is a poem from Rumi. Jalaluddin Rumi was born in Afghanistan, 1207. Then he went to Persia, and he said, the other side of right doing and the other side of wrong doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. And I will just encourage people, if I'm giving you that sign, you can always tell somebody that they could ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> you got the three more minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> just strategically, people. <laughs> like me. Well, yeah. <laughs> if anyone would like to ask me the question, <laughs> but if anybody has questions for Jim, you've got three minutes now for questions. I just, I have, I have kind of a question, maybe a statement, because I like statements. But um, it, I just I found that really interesting in this this concept too that in our friends we accept flaws, and so in that space where you're if you're judging, you're or befriending your judgments, are you willing to like accept that they're flawed and imperfect in that kind of space as you reflect with them? You're talking about the judgments. Yeah. So the question is in relationship to judgments. 
making friends out of them? Are we willing to accept flaws in our friends? Hmm? And I would say that uh, I go back to always to what the purpose of all this is, and to be in service. And if, if by being in service is to support something's growth rather than to be uh, critical of, criticism is great, but it doesn't work, no? Very often. <laughs> yeah. Can yes? You, can you talk about the relationship of uh, discernment to judgment? Very Seems good. Seems to me they're similar, but importantly different. The question is the, the relationship between discernment and judgment. To me, uh, judgment is somehow fixed. You know, I've made a decision about something and it's fixed. Discernment is the quality of being with something, witnessing rather than, than, you know. So I am with this idea, but it's flowing. It has a quality to it. So in terms of mediation, in terms of other things, discernment might be, that's a poisonous snake and I'm not gonna step over there, right? Uh, it's not necessarily a judgment, you know, like maybe it is a judgment, but uh, <laughs> discernment is closer to the role of the mediator than to be judging. It's like you're gathering information and you're making decisions based on it, but you're not making it hard and fast. You're bad, you're good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Jim, very Great. much. Yeah. So Jonathan has walked in just in time <laughs> to be <laughs> called <laughs> up. <laughs> I could, I could a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I feel like we all could have because you're all, everybody's so on schedule. But uh, we six minutes? Jacqueline, so, so the sis, you could have had six minutes, yeah. The, the, the <laughs> system is Darcy will flag you when you're ready to start. Don't okay. come forward of that spot. Okay. That, that black line is the, is the, is okay. the stop line. The stop line. And is there a flagging system when you have? I will flag one minute okay. and then uh, Jonathan Colton will play. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All lawyers need the flag to shut up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So my speed geek is on a fairly technical point, but once I explain it to you, I'm actually hoping that this could be a little bit more of a discussion because I really like your views and opinions on this matter, as I think they might differ greatly um, from the gut reaction most tax litigators have. Um, so my topic is as here, tax morality and principled settlements. Could mediation be used more often in the changing world of tax? So there is a rule in tax litigation that's very different than um, in other litigations. And this is that you cannot s settle unless you have a principled settlement. And a principled settlement is one that is based on law. So I'll try to give you an example. If you have only one issue, you can't just settle on the basis of, okay, well, you win 50% and, and we'll win 50%. You have to be able to support in law or fact that settlement position. So even on valuations, you need to be able to support with evidence, you know, where are you going to land? And so in, when it's a question of law, how does the, how should the tax law be interpreted? How should it be applied? You know, that is much more difficult in terms of coming up with a settlement. Now, a lot of practitioners, and I've heard, actually, I'll, I'll give the judges um, what I've heard a lot of judges say. A lot of judges have said, well, this is only how create like get creative because there's a lot of ways particularly if you have two issues or if you have you know this shouldn't be a bar to settlement in tax this shouldn't be a reason for you to push forward on on litigation that doesn't need to go to to court so we have this this is the this is kind of the overarching current state so now overlaying that currently, and you could not have missed this in the news, I don't think, 
we increasingly have these debates and discussions about tax morality. So, for example, the big hot topic right now are the private company rules that were just released and tax fairness and, you know, fairness for the middle class and, and everyone should pay their fair share. So, m merging those two ideas of tax fairness but also principled settlements, is there a growing role for mediation between taxpayers and the Canada Revenue Agency? especially since these are ongoing relationships, much like the neighbor dispute, you are never not going to have to file your taxes. You even have to file, you know, first the, a, a terminal return when you die. You are never going to get out of filing your taxes. You are always going to have an ongoing relationship with, with the Canada Revenue Agency and the officers of that agency. So you can imagine where you have taxpayers who think, oh, the Canada Revenue Agency is out to get me. They think everybody's a cheat, and you have Canada Revenue Agency on the other hand that, that thinks, well, everyone I see is, you can have a really <laughs> difficult time in, in disputes to come to any sort of settlement or even just discussions <laughs> between the two parties. So I'm wondering that all with all that background, um, I'm hoping to do some work on whether or not mediation or a version of mediation, maybe traditional mediation wouldn't be quite the right fit, but a version of mediation might be possible in this realm. And I'm, I'm hoping to do that actually as my major research paper for my master's. So I thought, what, a, what better place or time to come and see if anybody <laughs> <laughs> because tax lawyers will have the automatic reaction that no mediation, unless it's fact, unless it's factual, mediation doesn't play a role. There isn't a role for mediation. So I'm curious if people who have experience as mediators might see something more there. Is this a misunderstanding of what mediators can do, or oh, go ahead? I, I'm just going to flag timing. Yes. Um, and if you're going to invite people to talk, and they're going to talk on this, they're probably going to need to come up to talk. Oh, okay. Sorry, you'll have to come up to talk. Or, or you'll have to that repeat might... everything. So if you're inviting opinion, okay. that might be challenging. You might have to come up to talk. <laughs> <laughs> but you now have three minutes to invite okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, and I guess it's not really questions, it's more comments, right? Mm -hmm. is, is my, my initial thought is, is that to the extent that our role as mediators is to help people get better understandings of why positions are being taken and what's important to them in order to be able to understand fairness of outcomes, I think that mediation can play a really important role in, uh, in that environment. And also in the context of um, having a principled settlement, part of that is developing arguments that are based on those underlying um, interests of the parties which you would also be able to do in a mediation context and come up with joint arguments that you could use to support an outcome. Interesting. <laughs> Great. Says the lawyer. <laughs> well, I had almost the same kind of thoughts framed slightly differently than Jim, but I was just thinking that if you have two sides who both have concepts of how their position is principled, then the space in between can also often be argued as principled. And so if we have somebody, and you know, you're not going to be going to court unless you think you have a pretty good case as a tax lawyer, if both sides believe that their case is valid and held by principles, then the space in between them may be as well. And so that's an interesting space to explore. That's roomy, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that is interesting. Yeah. yeah. That is interesting. I have to think a little bit more on that, the space in between. Were you here to hear the quote that you had at the end? No, of I wasn't. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> I walked in right into it. I had a similar situation. I had a business. Mm -hmm. I had a tax inspector come to my shop and spend two days bugging me. Mm -hmm. And I looked at all this paperwork and I said look I don't do this because it takes a lot of time and it's trivial so I haven't claimed all this money I've also haven't declared all these things it all balanced out pretty well my 
concern, if I was trying to encourage mediation, has to do with the empowerment of the situation to resolve anything. There wouldn't be much point in, in going talking if the law wasn't changed. I think it fundamentally had to go to how these decisions are made, and fundamentally, it must come from purpose. Like, what is the purpose of collecting tax, and why, and who pays? And that has to be clear. And then you can, you know, like, you can rearrange the situation quite a bit. But without that, I am, so that's where I would go with it. I would go with power. <laughs> well, do you think having somebody who, like a mediator, who is a, um, uh, who is not on the side of either party, would be useful in explaining that? Because obviously, when you have these two parties, they may they may agree on a number of things, and often they do. So, is it useful to have somebody who doesn't have a side in the room to help them see where they agree? Uh, I bet you that in the big picture, that's trivial. Mm -hmm. You know that that you're spending a lot of time without the very clear statement of what the taxes are collected for, how who pays. Uh, so, anyway, that's my feeling from from my own experience. No? <laughs> so, so I'm going to acknowledge that we are actually out of time for Jacqueline, but if uh, we also are early because everybody's been moving quickly. So if you wanted to step up, Suzanne, I, I think it works. <laughs> I just feel rude because I cut everybody else off. <laughs> so after Suzanne talks, I'm going to invite anybody who has a question for any of the previous speakers who are still here to, to ask their question. You, um, the topic reminds me of having a discussion about whether in, in a different system you could do mediation because a law provides for what should happen. Mm -hmm. And my view has always been that mediation has a, has a role because often it's the, the, the lack of a principled resolution is a misunderstanding mm -hmm. of what the circumstances actually are. And in getting the stories out and in and in getting people to think about their positions, often the real facts get better established and you can find a resolution within the parameters of the law or the rules, as I'll just call it, the rules, which when you speak about law, everybody sees it who ministers these things as fixed. And yet when you sit and make decisions based on law as a, as a trier of, of, of some uh, cases, it's totally a different viewpoint that really what you hear and what comes out even in a typical uh, trial tends to move what happens. And so I don't see why mediation could not work. Interesting. Wonderful. Well, thank you. That gives me a place to start some yeah. of my... <laughs> <laughs> Better than the, uh, all of the answers I was getting from tax litigators, which was like, no, of course not. <laughs> and the two papers that are out there that I'm, I, you know, that are like, no, of course not. So <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Okay. Right. I'll All right. Well, I am genuinely going to say we have, we have 15 minutes left. So there are two things we could do. Uh, well, three. We could end early. Um, we could invite somebody up who has been sitting here thinking, wow, I wish I'd put my hand up for speed geeking and I've got five minutes worth of stuff to say. Or we could invite questions for really any of the people left. And if we don't choose any of those, I'll stand here for 15 minutes and make up something. So, yeah. <laughs> Wait, you get 15? Well, uh, yeah, because I'm the one who controlled the clock. So. <laughs> the beginning means she gets half an hour. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, I, I'm quite open. Is, is there somebody who would like to um, talk about something that has not had a chance to talk and would like to? Because that's probably where I'd start. I know it's a weird thing to invite you up for, with, with no preparation. Then are there questions? And we can invite up some of the speakers who are still here to answer some questions that you didn't get a chance to ask.
Was there another half to your I like I'd like oh, to no. hear Jen's <laughs> conclusion. No, it's right. just a small conclusion. Yeah, but well, I yeah. Jen, okay. come up and cool. give us a conclusion. All right. Give me a <laughs> That that was sufficient. It was actually it was very short. I was so close. I ran over. But basically uh, wait a second. Okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, ready? So what I didn't get to was my final point, which is what are the advantages of uh, demonstrating integrity in your person and in your process? And uh, I think the primary advantage is that you build trust with the people that you're working with. And the development of trust uh, in the context of a mediation is a predictor for a better outcome for everyone involved. Uh, so you're going to have a better process if you are able to uh, proceed with integrity. Uh, secondly, it creates a positive experience for your clients. So even if they don't resolve their dispute in mediation, they come out feeling that they've had a good process and satisfied with what they've come through. Um, the third advantage of operating with integrity is that you're able to build a reputation that way, particularly if you're seen as being consistent in how you manage your mediations. Um, often we mediate in environments where we have regular players in them, whether they be lawyers, social workers, counselors, whatever it might be, regular referral sources. Um, so by um, having um, integrity in your process, in your person, being consistent in how you manage those, it does allow you to build a reputation and that ideally is going to lead to referrals and increase your business. And finally, I think that um, working um, with integrity builds your own personal sense of self-esteem and gives you far greater job satisfaction uh, than if you don't do that. So that was my conclusion. Nice. So thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions about it or any comments about other advantages of integrity in, in how we operate? Okay. Somebody else can, can come up. <laughs> <laughs> or, or we can end. That is something. Yeah. We can end 10 minutes early. It's not a problem. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I actually kind of also wanted to hear more about Melanesia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we. Yeah. I, I, that was very interesting. Just because I, I kind of you sit there and you're like, there's got to be some connection back in some ways to like what we're going through here and like can we like are there is that something you're open to are there chatting about to draw back and forth between the two pieces in ways that are interesting because um, if it is i need you to come up here so you can um, record it well there are some academic papers on that i mean that's a whole other i don't think we really have time to go into that but uh the academic papers tend to say canada has a lot to show them but i wonder if maybe they have a lot to show uh, Canada and other parts of the world. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm yeah. just going to, I'm going to repeat that for the folks on live stream. Um, so Janine is saying there are some academic papers out there that are looking at and suggesting perhaps that Canada actually has done some positive things in reconciliation that might be of use in Melanesia, mm -hmm. but that uh, Janine actually has some real questions about whether that goes the other way. And there might be something to learn. And it certainly is, it, it's a topic um, mm -hmm. that maybe we can hear more about another time, mm -hmm. that there's uh, um, and something we might be interested in. Um, well, I'm going to just solicit any thoughts from the audience, and uh, but I am quite open to ending, but if somebody has something that they would still like to ask a question, I don't want to shut you down. Having said that, was something we could do. All right, clearly, if I'm going to be the timekeeper, if we do speed geeking again, I can have 15 people get through, not eight. <laughs> so maybe the, the, real, the real message we get here is I shouldn't be in charge of time. And we <laughs> you did a wonderful job. You got everybody on. <laughs> it's true. I was frightening. That's what, well, it, well, that's what we found out. We do have a person on, uh, okay. online who, uh, who's, who just wants to hear more about Melanesia as well, and big, big grinny face. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, 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 you're welcome to get up, Janine, or we well, can I'll invite you if you want to just talk. Sure. All right, we've got Asian. five more minutes of Melanesia. <laughs> Research that I've looked at. Great. Well, okay. I knew I wasn't going to be the only person who was saying, could you come back and talk? <laughs> well, uh, maybe I'll just start again where I left off. Um, and I was talking about the Bougainville crisis. So uh, it was due to the uh, mine, which it was actually producing 45% of the GDP of Papua New Guinea. And so 
1989, the crisis started, and it was the largest crisis in the Pacific since the Second World War. By, uh, and it was essentially mur murder, violence, and torture on both sides. So the mining company was thrown out by the Bougainville Revolutionary Army. Um, the Papua New Guinea Defense Forces came into the island. They were also thrown off. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Oh, ignore me. I'm no, just fixing okay. the mic. <laughs> ah. And um, by 1995, the crisis had lasted for eight years. And I found this fascinating. The leaders knew that if the war continued beyond the year 2000, it would involve the next generation. So a lot of their peacekeeping, um, a lot of their reconciliation, a lot of their ideas of maintaining peace is to not pass the conflict on. And the idea of conflicts being inherited. So it was in order to avoid that, that they actually uh, set up a way of getting some training and getting all of these different reconciliations to occur throughout the island. Um, I've met um, somebody who uh, did do one of the killings for which there was a reconciliation. It's an incredibly moving piece to read. Um, and uh, he's one of the people that I, I noticed he's at com completely at ease with the people on the other side of the conflict. So. There's um, a real lot of work that's been done in relation to reconciliations and some academic work. And uh, I'm going to check into it some more. So that's a little bit more. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> OK. And, and I'm going to suggest that we wrap at that point. But thank everybody. Um, and thank you all for your participation and your questions. Um, and there's lots of people here who were seed geeks. I really want to say thank you to all of our speakers and for stepping in and mm. trying out five minute presentations. They're tough. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Tough to know how long that is. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. I'm excited because we've got lots of new and different things. And I'm hoping we're going to take a break now. Sharon, if someone's online, should we be doing up there where they can hear you? They can hear me from here. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm, clo I'm right behind the mic, so they're okay. Um, but uh, for those, and they're also signing off because that's what usually happens. Yeah. But uh, for those of us who are sticking around, if you're sticking around for the business of mediation, we'll start that at 6.30 because we're going to have people coming in and they're going to have to be texting me to come back upstairs. Um, but uh, beyond that, there's lots of space to kind of sit around and talk and talk about the interactions of these various talks because I think that's one of the most interesting things was the degree to which we were getting all kinds of interesting synergies. Um, so this is a great space to kind of sit around and chat. Help yourself to refresh and things. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, um... Uh, I just need to agree. So, 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 Yeah, well, it's reasonable when it's not even happening.